Trump has taken us to a place where one of our parties now is anti-democracy. The craziest extreme has now taken over the middle. A pandemic of mass delusion to bring down our entire society. My guest today is Dan Partland, the award-winning director of Unfit, the psychology of Donald Trump, and he's out with. Dan, is it fair to call it a sequel, uh, Untruth? I, I bet you didn't imagine a sequel when you first started making Unfit, but the times sure demand one. Yeah, the new film, Untruth, the psychology of Trumpism, is absolutely uh, a type of a, a sequel. I mean, it's good for people who haven't seen the first film as well, but the first film that really focused on the psychology of Trump himself, and that ended up becoming an exploration of just the psychology of different authoritarian leaders over time. Um, the new film, um, on truth, the psychology of Trumpism. Yeah. I mean, we never imagined at, when Trump was defeated in 2020, that there would be a need for another film. It felt like, uh, I mean, usually American presidents who are defeated don't come back, but also <clears throat> that the country had been such, through such an ordeal and that um, people would be sort of uh, the appeal of, of Trump would have um, would have diminished. But obviously the issue is not Trump. Um, and that's why we did a film actually about the psychology of Trumpism. The question, I think, for us in the United States and for people in democracies around the world is why? Why is this happening? Why has the world in general, in the United States in particular, gone on this uh, slant where it is kind of losing touch with its democratic values and really finding a strong, strong appeal of uh, an authoritarian? And, and that's, yeah, that's, that's what the film attempts to wrestle with well you've got an all-star cast air quotes um that i think a lot of listeners of this show will will appreciate folks we've had on ruth ben giat anthony scaramucci joe walsh peter struck uh one of them said something that really stuck with me which is that trump and trumpism is an epiphenomenon can you explain that and you you kind of echoed it saying that trump is not the issue it's bigger than that yeah, that's right. I mean, that that's what he means. The, the comments from Imran Ahmed, who is, uh, runs an organization called the uh, Center for Countering Digital Hate. And we, we do try to look at um, the impact of social media on this dynamic, because I do think it's an important piece of the puzzle. But what he means when he says that Trump is an epiphenomenon is that yeah, Trump himself is a phenomenon, but obviously at this point we have to look at root causes. He is a result of something else. He's a result of something larger. And the re you know, the first film that focused on Trump's psychology, well, we, we really need to be looking at a general psychology of the electorate. Where are people at? What is in the water that makes them so interested in the solutions offered by an authoritarian. I think there are a number of things and they are very deeply psychological. We're living in an age of incredible anxiety right now. And what psychologists will, you know, ha can show us is that the more people feel anxious and uncertain about the future, the more the um, the, the greater the appeal of an authoritarian solution. And it's really because it's a simple solution. There's other uh, speculations that authoritarianism, it also rhymes with um, a lot of people's upbringing, right? That um, there people come from a, a household and as a child, you feel a lot of security when there is a strong, certain leader who's charting the course for you. That's a, a different theory. Um, but there are a lot of different things and it, they, they do re tend to relate back to the incredible rate of change and unease and anxiety that just exists in the culture right now. And that that tends to activate. The theory is that authoritarianism is a latent trait in all of us. And that when the right conditions present themselves, that trait can be activated and we're really drawn to the security that an authoritarian offers. The most important implication of this argument that Trump is a symptom, not a cause, is that even if Trump is defeated in November, the underlying factors are still present and the threat doesn't go away. I, I want to interrogate that because I've gone back and forth 
on this. I think you and I are both aligned that he has to be beaten in November because he he does represent such a, a threat to democracy. But I, I think in some ways he is a unique figure in in American history. And the way to test that is to try to imagine anyone else on the political scene today who could do what Trump has done. Can you imagine another political figure? Name anyone. J.D. Vance, uh, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, who could marshal the kind of followers who would kill for him, who would die for him. I, I just I can't picture it. No, it's a great, it's a great and important point. And I, you know, to me, it it's about, you know, history, I think, does sometimes turn on these unique moments where there, there's a confluence of factors. So there have always been guys like Trump. Yeah. But in other eras, they didn't take root. No one was interested in what they were peddling. So you really need both factors. I think you need the conditions to be fertile for such a character. And then you need a unique character like Trump who can who can bring it together for people. And there's a lot of different ways, uh, reasons that we could point to about why he's been an effective messenger for this idea. But taking a step back and looking at the international perspective, at that point, we, we can say, yes, Trump is absolutely a unique character in American history, but he's not a unique character in this moment in world history that there are other Trumpian figures who are on the rise in other supply, surprising places around the globe right now. And so that tells me that we really do need to look at the underlying phenomenon that made the ground fertile for these kind of leaders at this moment. And we have historical analogs that are incredibly instructive as well. I'm so glad you talked to Ruth ben Giat. Because, you know, everyone has made the Hitlerian comparison. I, I think much more accurate is the is the comparison to Mussolini and just the clownishness of of a character like that, but tinged with such menace and attached to capable people that it became the kind of threat that undid democracy and and plunged a region into into conflict. Yeah, you know, I, I mean Mussolini is a great uh comparison i think i think what you you know one of the things that we have to look at is again back to what what are people needing right now that leaders like this are providing and you know the interwar you know period in europe where uh, fascism was on the rise with characters like mussolini and hitler um they were you know they were offering ethno nationalism in both cases, really, they were they were elevating a certain portion of, the, of of a grieved population, and elevating them um, in the way that an ethno nationalist leader does, which is not not in a patriotic way that we would do in America, which is remember, you know, the 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 our creed is that we're all created equal and to be the land of opportunity and and things like this, but to say no, no, you've been getting a unfair shake, and we're from a policy perspective, we aren't necessarily going to do anything for you, anything meaningful for you, because Trump isn't really. Hey, there's some talk around the margins, but anyone who looks seriously is going to say that he's not actually promising to do anything for them. But he's doing something that I would contend is more important. He is elevating their status, right, and their sense of their identity, their sense of belonging. Um, and that is so, so important to people. You know, yes, when you look at w wars, you look at a lot of times, you know, wars are fought over a lot of nuts and bolts and resources, but the really horrible wars, they, they also have, uh, this other dimension that you're also fighting for identity. You're fighting for a lot of intangible emotional things. I mean, look at the terrible situation in the Middle East right now. Um, so I think that, I think that in this moment, um, we should look at, and you know, historians like Ruth Ben Gail would point this out that the failure, the the, the undoing, usually of the ethno nationalist leader, um, and the demagogues in general, is that they are ineffectual, right? They, they, because be, and they're ineffectual by their nature because they're peddling something that is emotionally feels very right to people, um, but is but isn't really very considered, right? That we're going to have a Muslim ban felt very right in the days after a, a Muslim person had shot up a nightclub. Um, but 
but it's not very thoughtful because actual, you know, violence, uh, mass violence in the United States really isn't coming from those kind of instances. And most Muslim people in the United States are not the ones who are doing the violence. Actually, most of the violence in the United States of that kind is homespun violence. Homespun violence of people who are very angry at usually at the changing um, at the changing demographics in the country. But with the advent of social media and the scalability of misinformation, Trump has has tapped into this carnival barker's ability to blame his failures on others. And I'm thinking mm. most recently of the disaster response in, in North Carolina, which by all believable accounts is going incredibly well in terms of the federal response. And yet uh, Trump is able to, to portray it as, as a failure, when in fact his response to disasters was largely a failure. He was the one who withheld FEMA funds for areas that tended to, to vote Democratic. I worked in the Trump administration. Never in a million years did I ever think that I'd be working in the White House with a president that didn't care about the American people. He would suggest not giving disaster relief to states that hadn't voted for him. I remember one time after a wildfire in California, he wouldn't send relief because it was a democratic state. So we went as far as looking up how many votes he got in those impacted areas to show him, these are people who voted for you. This isn't normal. The job of the president is to protect Americans, regardless of politics. But if Trump's elected again, there'll be no one to stop his worst instincts. You'll have yes men help him implement Project 2025's agenda. Unchecked power, no guardrails. They will be serving one man. We're in a new information ecosystem in which the failure of, of autocrats isn't as easily proven when they have the the megaphone, when they have the ability to transfer their own failures onto their enemies. Yeah, that's well said. I mean, I, I think the film really tries to deal with this. Um, I would I would just change I would change some of the things you said just by a little bit, which is uh, I think that there's a lot of coverage right now, especially related to the disaster response in North Carolina that is being pretty universally called by the media misinformation. And I really want to distinguish between misinformation and disinformation. And the film tries to do that because um, it's to me, it's all the difference in the world. Um, mis people get things wrong. That happens all the time. That's a mistake. Sometimes, sometimes people get things wrong. And in, in our modern, uh, you know, digital lives, it can get, it can become viral on itself and, and spread and spread and spread because it sounded good to people or whatever. There was something catchy about that mistake. Um, but misinformation is done in good faith. Disinformation is the deliberate sp spreading of untruths. And I think this is a world of difference. And I think we're really struggling in this moment. You know, the burden of a free society, freedom of speech, everybody wants to be free speech absolutists. But the truth is, free speech has never been absolute, right? You always have the unfettered right to truthful speech. And we've forgotten that. We've forgotten that, um, of course, um, you know, defamation has always been you always uh, people are always allowed to be held account if their if their untruths um, damage somebody else, with an absolute defense being that if what they said was truthful, if, if it's truthful and it damaged somebody else, that's always lawful, right? Um, truth in advertising, you know, people are not that's that's also not a free speech absolutism. You're not allowed to say untruths in advertising, right? You're not allowed to defame people. You're not allowed to incite people to unlawful behavior, like all of these things have always been, well, not always, there's been an evolution in the United States law, right? Truth in advertising probably came around in the 19 teens. But abs free speech absolutism doesn't actually serve. We want the free and unfettered flow of ideas, ideas waged in good faith. But untrue facts are not protected. And we've become very confused about that. If you're out there in bad faith, 
peddling knowing untruths, and that is doing damage to a portion, to a person, an institution, or a part of society, that is rightfully something that people can seek redress on. It's Ken Harbaugh. Quick break here to remind everyone, if you haven't yet subscribed to the podcast version of this show, please do. The link is below. And don't forget to rate and review. It makes a huge difference in how the algorithm ranks shows. Thanks for the support. And so I think we've become a little bit confused about where the boundaries ought to be. And as we get more and more of our information through social media, which are unprofessional sources often that don't hold themselves to the same standards as professional media. Um, this has really let a lot of certainly misinformation proliferate, but more importantly, disinformation proliferate. A lot of the false narratives that are out there and false facts that are out there are being deliberately pushed into the digital ecosystem in order to distort uh, the, the narrative for the electorate. And yeah. um, and absolutely, Trump has been uh, ha has been transparent about that. He has he's openly saying untruths, and we really, I think, uh, media have been flummoxed in their um, uh, ability to hold him to account on that. Do you have uh, uh, an answer short of relying on the courts to adjudicate what is disinformation and what isn't? You know, I I don't, but I think. I think that what I think it needs to start with the way we talk, with the way we have the conversation. I think that in some senses, like a lot of really good um, instincts in the way we have talked about these issues have led to a bad result. Um, I think it's important to recognize how um, how relative so many different things are, but, and, and that you can have bias. Like it's important for people to understand what's bias. It's important that people understand that different perspectives can in good faith report something differently. But I think that in that conversation, we've kind of confused people into thinking that that means that there is no truth. You know, there, there, there is, there aren't things that are knowable. And that's just not true. And so if you look back, you said, you know, yeah, we don't want to have to adjudicate these things in the courts, but let's just go back to some basic principles of knowledge, of knowledge and science, which is that there should be evidence. <laughs> and in the absence of evidence, um, we really can't take it to be a fact. Well, the film is Untruth, fantastic portrayal of this epi phenomenon. Dan, where can people find it? Oh, you know, people can find it everywhere. It's on Apple TV. It's on YouTube. It will someday be on Amazon, but it's been, it's had a terrible time. Uh, Amazon is the only place that is having a hard time getting it published, although they've had it for a very long time. It's on uh, Vudu and Fandango at home. And it's also on all the cable carriers, Bell, Shaw, Comcast, Xfinity. Um, really, we have 100% coverage in the United States. If you want to see it, your, wherever you get your on-demand content definitely has it. It's called Untruth, the Psychology of Trumpism. And it's really a good faith effort to understand what's going on, because I think that's the important thing as we go into this election. We have to remember um, 60, 70 million people voted for Donald Trump the second time, you know, after knowing everything he did wrong, after seeing the chaos. So it's not really about Trump anymore. Um, it's about us. And I think we have to re we have to make good faith efforts to repair what's going on in the society and reach out to all of those people um, with uh, some kindness and compassion and offer better solutions than what an authoritarian can offer them. Thanks, Dan. We'll put a link down in the show notes. Let's talk again soon. Thanks for having me. America is irrevocably divided. Our democracy right now is hanging by a thread, literally. Our politics have become so polarized and so damaging, we can't get anything done to reset the thing. We're gathered together in the heart of our nation's capital for one very basic and simple reason, to save our democracy. Party, it will become something unrecognizable, more so than it already is. 
Trump, in one respect, is an epiphenomenon. He's a result of something else that's been happening that's much bigger. The problem is what led to Trump and Trumpism. There is such a thing as fake news. It's called propaganda and disinformation. Donald Trump could carry out the manipulation of the people who never really watch legitimate news. You can literally frame the mindset of an entire nation. Good people can be deceived and their minds can be hacked. This is probably the most important psychological phenomena that's occurred in this lifetime. Trump has taken us to a place where one of our parties now is anti-democracy. The craziest extreme has now taken over the middle. A pandemic of mass delusion to bring down our entire society. Love this video? Make sure you stay up to date on the latest breaking news and all things Midas by signing up to the Midas Touch newsletter at MidasTouch.com newsletter.